the reading will not be um, unfamiliar to you now. It's from Exodus 3. It is Exodus 3 and part of, uh, of chapter 4. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go. Assemble the, the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, 
and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so this burning bush is a pivotal moment. And I mean pivotal in terms of if you think about a seesaw, when God speaks in this, this is actually changing the situation for the Israelites. It's really significant. It's a moment where a truth is acknowledged. In this case, the truth is that something needed to be done about the way that the Israelites were being treated by their hosts, the Egyptians. And you might raise an eyebrow when you are saying hosts. But this is the case. In this passage, God repeated, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But for me, the setting of this story actually sits with Jacob's son, Joseph. Joseph, the coat of many colours. You remember that he was sold by his brothers into slavery. He later interpreted the Pharaoh's strange dreams and saved Egypt from starvation during a seven-year famine. The Pharaoh, very pleased with Joseph, gave his extended family some land and invited them to live in Egypt. Invited them to live in Egypt. At this point, then, we have a good relationship between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Generations down the line, the Israelites prospered and grew in numbers. A new pharaoh came into power. We'll talk about 400-year period here. But he knew nothing of Joseph and the history. And in Exodus 1.19, he says, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing anymore. So initially, the Israelites were made into slaves but they encountered further hardships at the hands of the Egyptians. The Egyptian motivation was one of fear and resentment against the Israelites, and it seems to be a story which is repeated down the centuries. The relationship, though, here between the Egyptians and the Israelites had changed from being a good one into an abusive one. And if we were to give a title to today's sermon, it would be, What Can Exodus Tell Us About Leaving Harmful Relationships? And that's kind of what, what I'm looking at here. But first, we're going to have a few minutes of fun. We're going to watch a short clip from a well-renowned biblical study film, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> <laughs> this is the scene where the baron, if you've, if you've seen it, bursts into his wife's bedroom, singing happy birthday to himself. So, it's only a couple of minutes, but no falling asleep, all right? Because there will be questions afterwards. Thank you. Oh, don't move. 
What a picture. Such memories it brings back. Oh, ich kann dich fressen, meine süße Zuckerpuppe. My little dumpling. <laughs> my liebling. You're my little churchy face. My coochie, coochie, woochie, little churchy face. Every time I look at you, I sigh. And you're my little teddy bear. My lovey, lovey, dovey little teddy bear. You're the apple astute hell of mine eye. Your chuchy wuchy nose, your chuchy wuchy eyes, they set my heart a flutter. Your uchi kuchi rays, your uchi kuchi gaze, wilt me down like melting the butter. My little churchy face. And you're my teddy bear. Together, Together we're a churchy, woochy, oochy, coochy pair. Whatever you may ask becomes my heavy task. I only live to serve you. I never will divine what magic made you mine. I only know I don't deserve you. <laughs> you are my little. The choochy face. And you're my teddy bear. Together, Together we're a choochy, woochy, oochy, coochy. Choochy, woochy, oochy, coochy. Choochy, woochy, oochy, coochy. Right, so. Amusing, but also very dark, isn't it? Hey? So, open question time. I said to be questions. So, first thing, what was his wife's first reaction when he burst into the room? Do you remember? It was... Oh, shock, horror to start with, and then, what am I going to do? Uh... But just looking at that thing, what, what can we deduce about their relationship? Anybody? Anything? They didn't trust each other, okay. They didn't like each other. Yeah, it's, it's a funny relationship, isn't it? They didn't do that. How about that laugh when he, she fell into the trap? They, there was nothing real about that laugh, was it? It was a ha ha ha, I've got you, more than a hilarious thing. And it's strange singing that song, expressing endearments to one another, yet, you know, far from it. So, would you say that was a healthy relationship? Oh, no, far from it. I don't know if you counted, but how many times does he express a desire to hurt her? One more. Six. <laughs> Six. There's, uh, I don't know if I get them in the right order, there's with her, her, her hair, and when he tugs it, and as she's coming out of that, he elbows her in the stomach. There's the uh, axe coming down. When she's on the table, sticks her leg, comes off the table, that big dagger comes down and just misses her. Obviously falling into the trap. Oh dear, I've forgotten the last one. <laughs> but 
doesn't matter. There, there's another way. And earlier in the film, if you've seen the film, he actually fires at her with a shotgun saying, I've waited 20 years for this, <laughs> in a way. So the, together, they've been a long time. And you go, well, what is it? You know, do they actually know that this is a, a bad relationship? Or, 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 you know, why aren't they together? Why are they together? Whatever. And it raises a question, really, or are they denying it? But what might prevent people from actually changing relationships? Fear. Maybe you don't feel that they're unable to, uh, can't actually change a relationship, or they're worried about the consequences of changing the relationship. And they have what's sometimes called a fitting relationship, and it's quite common to have fitting relationships, that each have complementary strengths and weaknesses, if you like, and they can work for years until usually one of the people wants to change, and then the other person, out of fear, won't allow that change to occur. But I was just thinking, so that's just one relationship between them, but what other sorts of relationships do we have? Maybe one-to-one, -one. yeah? Family relationships that don't always go so well. Societal norms, you know, that's from the two Ronnies, isn't it? Humorous, but what do we laugh at? What do we find funny? We find horrible truths funny and there's a horrible truth about our society in there isn't it this class system that we're working very hard to get rid of but it still persists uh you know husbands and wives did we get that one did you i don't know if you've done that one no we can have bad relationships like that and don't forget this can be reversed sometimes wives beat their husbands um we can have bad relationships with ourselves. We might self-harm. We might have eating disorders. Or we can become addicted to various things. And I don't know if some of you saw a little while ago, David Badil did a program. He was worried about, I think a lot of people were concerned about the effects of social media on our society. And he admitted that he was addicted to Twitter. Um, and in the program, he decided that he would come off Twitter for a while. But while he was still on it, he had his brain scanned so they could see where brain activity was most prevalent. And it was most prevalent working very hard in the flight or fight thing, which makes people hyper, and it kind of explains why people seem to be very quick-tempered these days. They're already in an elevated frame of mind, if you like. Um, and then he had his two weeks off. Oh, sorry, prior to that, he also had a, a psychological profile check to see how, really, what his mood was like. And then the two weeks off, and he went back into this and had his brain scanned again. And uh, it was showing slightly different signs that he wasn't as active uh, in flight or fight, but was more active in dopamine type things, a feel good factor stuff. More relaxed. And he admitted that he was more relaxed. Yet, a as soon as that two weeks was over, he was back on Twitter. It's, it's, it's that horrible hook that uh, you get caught into. And it's not only one, I've lost it now. And this appeared in one of the Sunday magazines there. Sorry, baby, money, mummy's busy taking drugs. And it's talking about middle classes, and I think some of people here may consider themselves to be middle class. Cocaine is the scourge of the middle class at the moment. I'm favoured, particularly, apparently, amongst lawyers for some reason, so I'm kind of thinking one day I have these dreams about Prime Minister and having a big thing about drugs. 
I think uh, I'd have a trouble, wouldn't I, when I find that lawyers and jug, uh, judges are the people actually using them. But it's, it's, it's tough, isn't it? And so I want to just come back now to the Moses and the burning bush. So God has recognised the situation and decides on a remedy. I think I'm a bit coming a bit reverberating there. And he wants Moses to guide the people of Egypt out. Of, um, and he tells Moses. So this is the first requirement, isn't it? If we're trying to leave one of these situations, really. First, we have to recognise that we're in a toxic relationship. If you don't recognise it, how on earth are you going to sort it out? Uh, simply, you're not. And this is how the Israelites were. They were busy moaning and groaning, but not actually thinking about their situation. It's easy for me to say with hindsight, of course, but they perhaps should have been more like, this situation is wrong, what are we going to do about it? And in fairness, sometimes the problem is not apparent to those who are immersed in it. They need someone from outside to point the problem out to them. And occasionally this is where this situation with the burning bush kind of works. I think Moses did the right thing. He listened to this outside voice, if you like, from God. But he wasn't too keen on what God said, was he? What was Moses' first reaction? I'm going to paraphrase now, but essentially Moses goes, Why me? How on earth do you think I'm going to be able to do that? And, you know, it was a monumental task that he was being given, and understandably, Moses can't believe that he's capable of doing it. But what we see, the problem is acknowledged, tacitly at least by Moses, but he doesn't want to be involved. So the second part of actually getting out one of these situations is you have to take responsibility. You've got to actually do something. But why doesn't Moses want to be involved? What puts us off making major changes to relationships? Maybe we don't see the situation, possibly like those two we just saw in there. Or like Moses, we may doubt our capability of dealing with us. Or we're frightened of failure. Or we fear the consequences. What's life going to be like without? And, you know, it's a fear of emptiness, perhaps. But Moses expresses his concerns, and God's response is, I will be with you. And this applies to us, too. God will be with us. He may not give us what we think we need, very much like he didn't give Moses what he wanted. But he will be with us. And I think it's important that we accept that and we have to trust that he will be with us. In Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And in the context of what we're talking about, I kind of think this means that you can, you trust in the Lord, you can step forward Lord doesn't expect you to get it right first time, second time, or even third time. He will make mistakes. It doesn't matter. But when trusting in the Lord, you will have the confidence. When nourished by the Lord, you will have the energy to keep trying, and eventually you'll succeed. And back to Moses, but he doubts his capabilities. He expresses several times, and each time God offers progressively more support, including uh, the ability to perform some miraculous acts, for instance, turning his rod into a snake, for example. And he got Aaron to help him with public speaking, for want of a better expression. 
Now, earlier, we noticed that in a one-sided abusive relationship, one partner will do all they can to maintain it. They'll make it very difficult for the other person to leave. And the same applies to people with addictions. Whatever it is, the drug, alcohol, gambling, it doesn't matter. The drug keeps calling them back. We use the term hooked. It's hooked on heroin, for example. In this story, the pharaoh is hooked on having the Israelites as slaves. He's not going to let them go. No interest in that at all. And it requires some very strong intervention from God to persuade the pharaoh, and you remember the plagues. And even then, the pharaoh says they can go, and he changes his mind and chases after them. And the point is, really, it's just trying to show how difficult it can be to make that first move. But God will be with you. That's what he says there to Moses. So the Israelites took that first step. They severed that bond. But what happened once they'd escaped? God directed them south into the Sinai Desert. No water. No food. A barren place. But this mirrors what occurs to us, though, doesn't it? This in part, is what we fear when we sever a relationship. We fear an emptiness. And sometimes, of course, it's not about us severing a relationship, but sometimes relationships are severed for one reason or other, and we have that horrible feeling of emptiness, a painful void that we're desperate to fill. But coming back to the Egyptians again, why would Moses send them to Sinai. Why would he make them suffer? He promised them the land of milk and honey. They will, they will be feeling duped. I know I would. After the land of milk and honey, oh, here's the desert. Well, why does he send them straight there? And I don't think it's that easy. For one thing, they had some major battles to fight. There's no way that they were ready for that just yet. So in those early days, they were bickering and moaning and some of them even wanting to return to slavery. Many thought that slavery was better than Sinai. You might raise an eyebrow at that. What? You want to go back? Yet, this is a common response, isn't it? We often hear, I have that picture of the woman up there with the threatening there, but often hear of women either returning to an abusive relationship or going straight into another. How often do addicts return to their habit? And there is a key word, really, habit. We are creatures of habit. The familiar routines however damaging, are comforting. It's a bit like being comforted by the devil, actually. And you know, this makes me think about Lot's wife, looking back. <laughs> she was kind of hooked on what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, but we can't turn back. It just doesn't work. So, we've got to go, well, what's good about Sinai then? You know, what's good about having this horrible, barren period? And if we look at the Israelites, there are some truths to acknowledge. They were half-hearted. They were a rabble. They were an absolute mess. And so are we when we first emerge from abusive relationships. We actually need some time to settle down. We need to think about who we are, what we have become, what we want to become. You can't do this on your own. You need some support. And it was no different from the Israelites. You know, they were no longer slaves 
but they still had a slave's mentality. They had to work at forming an identity, both as individuals and as a nation. They needed time to become proud people, ready to stand up for themselves, fight their own battles, make decisions and take responsibility. They needed to reform their relationship with themselves and with God. And I was surprised when preparing for this sermon just how much of Exodus is actually about forming a relationship with God. Most of the stuff from chapter 13 to 40, 13 to 40, recounts this struggle. And it wasn't easy, far from it. They had to accept new rules, Ten Commandments, for example, learn new ways of being, let go of some of their old ways of being, learn to take responsibility, learn to take the initiative. They were no longer slaves. And these changes, I guess, were the consequences of leaving um, Egypt. And of course, they fell by the wayside from time to time. And the story of the golden calf stands out as the big one, doesn't it? Their leader, Moses, had disappeared for 40 days. That's a long time, you know, for a rabble to be taken out of somewhere and then the leader disappears up this mountain, a month and a half nearly. And they, so they, want, they don't know what's happened to him, so they persuade Aaron to make some gods. Chapter 32 when the, it says, when the people saw how long it was taken Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods that can lead us. We don't know what's happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from that land of Egypt. And I think this just shows how easily vulnerable people, because the Egyptians at this stage were vulnerable, but how easy, vulnerable people will clutch onto anything that makes them feel safe. No matter how false. And the fact that forming a relationship with God occupies two-thirds thereabout of as Exodus is perhaps an indication of, one, how problematic it can be. And you might raise an eyebrow at me saying it can be problematic, but it was problematic for the Egyptians. But yet, how important it is. And it was only once that this was all over that God allowed them then to start their journey towards the promised land. And it brings us back to, in a sense, what Matt has been talking about for the last few weeks, about us then approaching God in prayer. And I'm just finished by Going back to that reading, it says, as Moses approaches the burning bush, in verse 4, God calls out to Moses, and Moses replies, here I am. And in verse 12, God answers, I will be with you. And if we were to boil all this right down to the bare bones, it would be something like, present yourself to God, Trust in God, and God will be with you. It's as simple as that. 